Welcome back. It feels like it's been forever. Uh, welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session nine of our Sauron defeated discussion. Uh, delayed first by a very unfortunate illness. Uh, I, 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 I hope that this summer cold slash flu thing passes by you because yikes. Uh, anyway, so that was the week before last, which was fun. Last week was a uh, family trip. My family went to Quebec City, which was definitely fun, much more fun than the flu. Uh, so <laughs> they probably shouldn't adopt that as a tourist slogan. Uh, I wouldn't suggest. But anyway, um, it was um, uh, last week was uh, was was a, a great time with my family. So uh, but we're back this week and ready to get back into Sauron Defeated. I was especially disappointed to not have class last or the week before last uh, because I really had hoped to finish this long discussion from Raymer that we've stopped in the middle of because it's super complicated. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I thought we, I felt like we had a really good session three weeks ago on the front half of it. And I really wanted to dig straight back into it again. And now it's been like three weeks and I barely remember anything. So we'll have to do our best to uh, see if we can kind of recover where we were there. Um, first though, a couple announcements, including, uh, several very relevant and important announcements. Um, uh, so first, uh, Signum classes begin this coming Monday. So on Monday the 26th, I think is Monday, uh, uh, of August, uh, is the first day of our fall semester. So definitely if you are... Um, if you're interested in auditing, uh, or, you know, if you've been taking our classes, definitely don't, you know, don't, don't miss out. You know, the semester's about to begin. Uh, still time to get involved if you want to get involved. Uh, but, um... Time's a wasting if you haven't signed up yet. So uh, do get in and do that. The second thing is um, we have our next Mythgard movie club, uh, which is a, a very relevant one for those of you who have been around for a while. Uh, we are finally going to talk about the new Netflix Watership Down uh, series. So um, uh, a, lot, a lot, I mean, ever since that came out Christmas time last year, lots of people have been asking about that. We've had a little bit of discussion like on Twitter and stuff about that. But um, uh, anyway, we're going to do a full Mythgard Movie Club session about that. That's going to be on the 5th of September, Thursday, September 5th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. So um, I'm uh, uh, looking forward to talking about that uh, with you guys. So um, anyway, the last and uh, even more relevant and exciting news is we are only only have a few more days left in the voting cycle for the next book that we do after Sauron defeated our next non-Tolkien book. Uh, the election is open. Our finalists are a wonderful set of finalists. I am ex whatever it is we end up doing. I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be happy. Um, we have the four finalists are Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis, which has been a finalist several times before. Best book C.S. Lewis ever wrote, as far as I'm concerned, uh, which is saying a lot. I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. Um, a Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin. Inferno by Dante. And American Gods by Neil Gaiman. So we've got three classics of modern fantasy and uh, Dante's Inferno. Uh, you know, one of the classics of all world literature. So Really wonderful options. My understanding is that it's uh, it's it's you know down to the wire here. Uh, so if you haven't voted, uh, you know if you have a vote in the Signum Academy uh, and you haven't voted yet, make sure you do that. You should have gotten an email uh, from Ed Powell, our, uh, our our mind of metal and wheels, who makes all this stuff happen behind the scenes, and uh, uh, make sure you uh, you do your. Um, do your voting, Zach. I yeah, I, it would be hard. It's it's a hard vote. It's a hard. I'm not going to say what I would vote for, but um, uh, but anyway, it's going to be it's going to be great fun. Whatever it is that we do, so make sure to make your your voice heard and help us decide. I'll probably be able to announce it. I think next week. Uh, so we'll, I'll look forward to that uh, in our next class. Um, okay, very good. So uh, getting back into. Uh, uh, getting back into things here tonight. I want to... Okay, let me start with a very broad recap just to kind of help reorient us a little bit uh, into where we 
you know, where we where we are and where we've been here. Um, Raymer is talking about how. So you'll remember how in that in the first big session with an, in the Notion Club papers, they're critiquing Raymer's science fiction story, and they're having that long discussion that we talked about before about the mechanism of space travel and how unconvincing the mechanism of space travel was. And um, at the end, Dolbear, who had been asleep during most of the reading and subsequent discussion, pops up. And, and says that he can tell that Raymer is not making up that story, right? And asks him to explain how did he get there and, and uh, uh, you know, how did that happen? Um, so, okay. Um, then Raymer promises to explain how he ended up traveling to this other world, uh, how he ended up accomplishing space travel, which he then, you know, made up this really unconvincing spaceship, apparently, uh, in order to uh, in order to kind of explain and hope people wouldn't notice. So last time we were talking about the first half of Raymer's long explanation of this and the essential mechanism and now here, I want to be careful because, again, what, what was the vocabulary I was using? I want to make sure I don't mess up my vocabulary one class to the next. Because I remember I was using machine for one thing and mechanism for the other. And if I remember correctly, the machine, I was using the word machine for the actual, oh, shoot. I don't remember. One of them I was using for the actual, like, contraption that one makes in order to travel and the other I was using for the uh, the 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 literary device that one uses to accomplish the end that one wants um, uh, I think machine was the contraption yeah I think that too Devora. and if I'm changing <laughs> I apologize and I'll just try to be consistent to the new definitions uh, in this in this class okay mechanism was the literary device okay good okay, I was pretty sure that was the case but I had a sudden flash of doubt there okay um, so they were talking about uh, their primary concern was the literary mechanism how do you get people to different uh, to different worlds because uh, Guildford, in, Nichols Guildford in particular, in the Notion Club, hates the machines, you know, machines in general, and hates uh, space travel in particular. So Raymer explains that he had been searching first for a new literary mechanism, right? A new mecha He wanted to write space travel, space and time travel stories, but he wanted a better mechanism than just, you know, waving his hands and saying, there's a machine and it works. Um... So, uh, but he then explains that his search for a new mechanism ended up leading him into actual space and time travel. And the machine, uh, in a sense, right, that he was using for his actual travel was dreams, right? Um, so we get this long discussion about the dreaming mind and the waking mind and the way in which he, through sort of practice, right, made himself more receptive to, uh, like, the messages that are, uh, um, you know, that, that are sort of coming through the, the sort of the, the memories retained by other objects and things, like the time that he spent communing with the meteor, right, and sort of listening to the meteor, uh, and sort of opening himself up to it. And it's not his waking mind that was able to process that input. Uh, it was his dreaming mind. And one of the things that we were seeing last time was that Raymer was saying that the the sort of subcreative mind, the imaginative mind, was sort of part of that. You know what the two of the things that were involved in that process of the dreaming mind's travels, right? Uh, two things that were connected with it were composition, right? Like writing stories, making up stories, and secondly, uh, translation, right? That there are some things that the dreaming mind is translating. Uh, and you know which the waking mind can't um, uh, can't absolutely sort of handle or understand. Okay, so that's kind of where we got up to up to the point where you know we and in what the last slide, as I recall, 
uh, was when we were talking about the insignificant picture. So when he'd have this kind of flash memory, right, of this moment, um, and he would know it was really significant. He would associate it with a particular thing, um, and he wouldn't know why exactly, right? He would have this 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 Im- image would would come into his head, uh, you know, like he described the the scene that we were looking at was the one where he described this young man walking up a hill in the dark and it's like really shabby and then this door opens and the whole thing looks kind of shabby and creepy and everything. And um, uh, and he wakes up, right? And he remembers that snippet and he knows that it's really significant on the one hand. Like he, uh, he associates it powerfully with joy, with happiness, but he doesn't know why, right? And then he eventually learns why as he gets better at this and, and uh, is able to sort of, you know, connect with his dreaming mind more and more. Um, he ends up learning the whole story of which that picture is a part. And it turns out that the reason he associated it with joy was that in the story of which that was a scene, that when the door opens, it's about to lead to this lover's reunion, right? It's the, you know, the woman is emerging out the back of the house and, and they meet you know, uh, you catastrophically and are really happy. But of course, but he, as he points out, so it's significant in that way, but as he points out, it's actually, it wasn't a very good story and it it didn't even end happily or anything. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a significant moment in the story. Exactly. Um, so what do we do with all this? Like, what is the point of all this? Several things. Uh, so first we have to remember the subject of conversation, and sometimes it's easy to forget the subject of conversation in this section, is Raymer's travel in space and time. And we'll get that much more clearly in tonight's session as we get to the second half of their conversation. Um, but I also, I cannot forbear to focus on the, th- the, and here I want to be so careful about how I say these things. I don't even really know how to talk about this exactly, to be totally honest. But it is very difficult. No, it's impossible for me to avoid the sense as I'm reading the Notion Club papers. And it is strikingly striking me more powerfully this time than any other time I've ever read them. That we gain remarkable insights into how Tolkien's creative mind works in this story more than almost anywhere else that I know of. Um, And I want to be really careful here. I want to be really careful because it's really easy to make mistakes here. It's really easy to once you kind of move in this direction, right? To say like, oh, Tolkien's, what Tolkien's describing is his own personal experience, right? Um, You know, if you, once you start saying like, Raymer equals Tolkien, right? And every, you know, uh, through the mouth of the character Raymer, he is, you know, saying all the things that he never said anywhere else. Once you start down that road, it's really hard to resist and it's super easy to get completely out of control with that, right? Because it's almost certainly not, simple in that way, right? You know, it's absolutely, I I cannot believe that it is simple that way, but similarly, I can't believe it's irrelevant either. Um, I think that we can see, and there's too many things that Raymer says, which are too similar to things either that Tolkien says indirectly or, or things, patterns that we can observe in his own writing and in his other comments on his own writing and his own writing process. Um, that I cannot help but feel that a lot of the things that Raymer says reflect Tolkien's own experience, reflect Tolkien's own, uh, well, experiences in more than one sense, really. Um, uh, things that are involved in his relationship with stories and his relationship with language also. Um, so, I get, you guys know, I mean, if you guys, anyone, any of you have been doing classes with me or listening to my podcast for very long, know how uh, uneasy I am drawing autobiographical conclusions about Tolkien himself. Um, and I found myself actually want, like, trying to resist this as I was going through 
this section. I'm like, no, I can't. No, I, I'm not gonna, just going to do that. I'm not just going to be like, oh, here's this is what Tolkien is saying. It's really like for him. Um, but then Christopher keeps doing things like this in his notes. Right. This is from a slightly earlier path from the stuff that we were talking about last time. You may rem- you may remember at one point, uh, Raymer mentions this one dream that he had was just a dream of pure weight, like he couldn't see anything or sense anything else. It was just this sensation of weight, right? Um, and then Christopher puts in his end notes. My father once described to me his dream of pure weight, but I do not remember when it, when that was. Probably before this time. So, like, yeah, Tolkien himself had that dream, in fact. So Christopher just kind of casually says, oh, yeah, that's totally autobiographical, right? And then, of course, we know there are other elements which Tolkien himself has explained uh, uh, were totally autobiographical, namely, of course, the dream of the wave. So we know. I mean, Christopher has told us, Tolkien himself tells us, we know from their testimony that some of this stuff is, in fact, autobiographical. That, of course, does not justify us in saying everything is is autobiographical, but it certainly prevents me from thinking that... I mean, I can't fight it. Like, I can't fight it completely. I can't just be like, no, no, no biography here. Don't pay any attention. Um, that, That would be obviously absurd. So we just have to kind of be cautious about this. Uh, And in being, let me be a little bit more specific when I say being cautious. What does being cautious look like here? Um, What I want to, one possibility, I'm not saying these are the only possibilities for reading this, but um, there are two simple ways to read a lot of these statements, right? Raymer's descriptions. One simple way is like, this is just pure fiction. Right? This has nothing to do with Tolkien's own personal experience. This is just him imagining all this stuff. Right, Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Right, That's, that's one simple reading of this. The other simple reading is, yeah, this is just... Tolkien is saying these things and like he doesn't say them anywhere else right? explicitly because you know he doesn't want people to think he's crazy. But so through fiction, he's basically saying, describing exactly his own. So when Raymer is speaking in the first person, you can just hear that in Tolkien's voice. It's Tolkien talking about his own personal experience. Those are the two sort of extreme readings. There are ways to read in the middle. So when I talk about being cautious, I want us to be thinking about what kinds of middle grounds are there. Um, and here's one of the the simplest forms of that kind of caution or that kind of middle ground reading that I would suggest. I think that Tolkien could be drawing from his own experience and some of his own dreams and things and have Raymer say things or or make certain claims or put forward certain ideas, not because Tolkien himself totally believes that or is 100% percent convinced that it's not completely fiction either right these are ideas that he has about the stuff that he's experienced about the stuff that happens with him but he i think perhaps one again one possibility is that he's kind of putting them forward in a fictional framework in part rather than in a critical framework right or in an essay in part because he's really tentative about it right he's he's not really sure he's just kind of this is sort of a what if, right? Like, so I've had certain, I have certain dreams, I have certain experiences, I have certain uh, relation, a certain relationship with languages and la- with languages in general, with language in general, with la- particular languages in particular. So he has these ideas. He's not saying that he's convinced that these things are fact, but he's sort of playing with the idea. Right. Sort of working out the, you know, letting the idea work out and seeing what it's like. Um, The reason I suggest this is that I think it's my opinion that this is what he's doing with a lot of things in, say, in The Lord of the Rings, a lot of the Anglo-Saxon stuff in The Lord of the Rings. Of course, Tom Shippey uh, is really good on these things. Um, You know, he doesn't. So many things that he might have said in a book on Beowulf that he might have written. Right which instead he just puts into his books. Um, 
And he says things, and this is something that uh, both uh, Tom Shippey and Mike Drought I've heard speak uh, very well on. He will often say things that are really quite controversial, right? Um, he'll take flyers on things, right? And it's almost like he, he, he's not exactly saying, I am sure that this is what the Beowulf poet meant in this particular line, right? He's not saying, I'm sure that this is the right way to interpret this line. But he's saying, I kind of think this is how it should be interpreted. So let's see if it works, right? Let's watch that play out. Let's experiment with it. Boom, full exactly. It's like he's, con he's contemplating these things, not arguing. He's not, he's not, ha he doesn't have his mind made up. I think this is one of the ways in which he kind of, I don't know, tries to make sense of, you know, plays out his, his, and play is perhaps not the right word, but I hope you see what I mean. Um, uh, he kind of works through these ideas, right? Um, Stephen, I really like that image. Stephen says, you know, the, the work is essentially a pensive for him. I love that. Just like Dumbledore pulls out his thoughts and sort of stirs them around in the bowl uh, so that he can see them more clearly from the outside, right? Um, yes, that does seem to me more a way, more or less, the way that it works um, uh, with him. Um, so... Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that, and like I say, there are other kind of shades of reading, like some things where we, you know, he may be, there may be moments here where he is sort of giving voice to sort of a private conviction that he can't prove and would not therefore flatly assert in general, right? But he's kind of throwing it out there because he, he sort of, you know, he does kind of believe that, right? So there might be some which are more heavily towards the autobiography side of the of the of the spectrum. There might be other things which are much more pure fictional, right? You know, things which Raymer is saying just because you know, which he has Raymer say because of the whole fictional framework of this story, right? He Tolkien, like Raymer, right, is sitting down to write a, a, a space and time travel story, um, and so it's as we looked at before, very meta. Right as he's uh, writing a uh, writing a story in which he is coming up with a um, uh, an alternative mechanism for space and time travel, uh, and within that story, the protagonist is coming up with an alternative mechanism for space and time travel. So, it, it, a lot of the stuff that Raymer says, no doubt, is just part of that fictional frame, and so it's not really autobiographical. Do I believe that Tolkien? thought that he traveled in space and you know had seen Saturn and 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 Venus and 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 Jupiter no I, I doubt that I doubt that Tolkien believed he had traveled in space and time exactly right but there are other things that he says which seem to me much more uh, likely to have a degree of conviction behind them. And again, I say a degree, not 100%, not like this is his faith statement, right? But rather, um, this is something that I think he he kind of, I bet he does believe in personally. So it makes it really complicated. But as I said, we can't avoid it. I think it's silly to avoid it um, or just to pretend it doesn't, ex you know, it doesn't exist here uh, in this, uh, in this work. Yeah. Devorah says it's a, it's a supposal. Yeah. I really like that uh, expression as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Okay, so with that in mind, let's return to Raymer. Uh, he, this is so, uh, right after the, um, he's describing the experience of, in his dreaming mind, entering into a story, a fictional story, right, that his dreaming mind has composed, right? And uh, Jeremy who you'll remember is the fantasy and science fiction scholar, right, um, uh, jumps in with elvish drama, Jeremy interposed. There's something about it, but we had heard him on that topic before. Raymer has the floor, we cried. <laughs> I just love this, how Jeremy comes in with a Tolkien quote, 
right? Uh, Jeremy has read on fairy stories and is about to start lecturing on one of Tolkien's own ideas. And then Tolkien has everybody else shout down the guy who's going to ex- expound on uh, Tolkien's own idea. Um, if you, um, uh, if you remember, or if you read the end notes here, um, uh, in one of the earlier drafts, Jeremy says, or, you know, the, the, Jeremy brings up fairy and drama and um, and then somebody says, oh, yeah, that's one of those Lewis ideas. Right. And then he's like, no, you know, Jeremy says, no, it wasn't Lewis. It was one of the uh, one of the other minor figures from his circle. Right. Uh, uh, which is, of course, Tolkien himself and on fairy stories. Um, okay, anyway, well, anyway, Raymer went on. The whole story, as it told, becomes visible and audible, and the composer is inside it, though he can take his stand in some odd positions, often high up, unless he puts himself into the play, as he can at any moment. The scenes look real, but are feigned, and the composition is not complete like a slice of life. It can be given in selected scenes and compressed like a drama. Also, it can, when you're working over it again or merely inspecting it, be reviewed in any order and at varying speeds, like rereading or reconsidering a book. I think that is one, though only one, of the reasons why the memory of such dreams, when any survives at all, is so often dissolving or jumbled. The dreamer is aware, of course, that he is author and producer, at any rate, while he is at work asleep. But he can get far more absorbed by his work than a waking man is by any book or play that he is either writing or reading. And he can feel the emotions very strongly, excessively sometimes, because they are heightened by the excitement of combining authorship with, act- with an acting part. And in memory, they may be exaggerated still more through getting dislocated, abstracted from the sounds and scenes that would explain them. Now, one of the things that I... Uh, one of the things that I think is fascinating, one of the sort of side notes or, or sort of um, sub threads of uh, uh, of the Notion Club papers for me is it provides potentially again, we have to be a little cautious in this, too, um, but potentially some really interesting glosses on some passages and on fairy stories. And this is one example of that. Right. When Tolkien talks about fairy and drama in on fairy stories, um, he's talking about it's in the context of fantasy and art, right? He's talking about fantasy and art, um, and he brings up fairy and drama. That is the idea of enchantment when a work of art. It's, so remember in on fairy stories, he talks about primary belief and secondary belief, right? There's the primary world uh, around us, and then there's the secondary world of the work of fiction that we enter, right, imaginatively. Okay, and so we have primary belief in the one, and we have secondary belief in the other. It's not about suspension of disbelief, which is pitiful. Uh, It's about investment of secondary belief in this secondary world, right? And he sort of gives fairy and drama as, like, the ultimate example of that, and he casually says, like, it's the kind of things that elves can do, right? One of several moments in On Fairy Stories when he speaks as if he certainly believes that elves exist. Um, Again... Is that does is that true or is that just sort of the uh, sort of figure of speech that he's adopting there? Um, uh, anyway, elves have this more extreme versions uh, version of um, uh, uh, of art, right? Where y- the where you are like you lose sight of the primary world, right? Your secondary belief becomes so complete that you've mistakenly believe that you are actually in the secondary world. Um, That is what it means to be enchanted. Um, And we can see examples of that kind of thing. Um, You know, and I've done this kind of thing before several times. Um, Looking at examples of this kind of thing uh, within the narrative uh, in Tolkien's work. For instance, Bilbo in chapter one of The Hobbit, right? When he's listening to the dwarf song, he is briefly enchanted, right? And he begins to think those dwarvish thoughts, remember? Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, when he starts looking out at the, the, the stars in the sky like gems and um, thinking, you know, and feeling the desire of the hearts of dwarves. 
Bilbo is briefly enchanted. He is sort of swept away past mere sort of the kind of secondary belief that you have when you're sitting and reading a book uh, and begins to experience it himself uh, firsthand in this imaginative world. Um, uh, so, anyway, it's sort of theoretical, it seems, right? That he's sort of, pre- he seems to be presenting that mostly, I think, in On Fairy Stories as, again, just a sort of the logical extreme of the concept of secondary belief and of, of, of art and fantasy that he's describing. Um, here, he's talking about the same thing, right? And he even has Jeremy interpose with the, with a quote, uh, you know, with the phrase quoted from on fairy stories, uh, to make that connection explicit. Um, this is where like fiction writing happens, right? Or like, this is where the great writing happens. Your, your dreaming mind is doing this stuff. So what, what, so what we have here, and this goes back to the, these, significant pictures when you have this picture in your head and you know you feel that it means something and you have even this emotional association to it like joy with this picture of this guy walking up the hill in the darkness um you know walking up the street in the darkness uh you know that it means something you know that it's part of something so uh, this is about that discovery right that sense of not when you are writing a story these pictures come into your head that you're not inventing yourself. Your waking mind is not in, is not making them up, right? You're receiving them. You're perceiving them from something else, right? You're perceiving them afar like they are outside uh, and, you know, like you're remembering them, not like you are uh, inventing them, right? And so how Raymer describes this, the connection that he seems to imply here is that Fairy and drama is not theoretical or just something that, like, in fantasy, elves can do. It's what your dreaming mind does. It's what your dreaming mind does. So, within your dreams, your dreaming mind is writing stories. But your dreaming mind is writing stories it has a completely different relationship with it. Because you are dreaming, you yourself can do fairy and drama. You can do elvish drama yourself. You can make it happen around you. Your story unfolds around you and you are you can be director, you can be up looking down on it, you can compress it and move it. Um, but you are also, you can also act in it. You are, it's taking part around you. Um, in the dream world, the story is real, right? Or you are surrounded by it. Um, and the implication, therefore, now again, Raymer is still thinking about the dreaming mind as the as the machine right for space and time travel so raymer is kind of talking about this fairy and drama stuff this subcreation that your dreaming mind undertakes the stories that your dreaming mind writes right he's talking about that in the context really only um really only um in order to show the way the like the kinds of things that your dreaming mind can do to sort of help you understand the difference between the waking mind and the dreaming mind and how the dreaming mind is capable of going places and doing things um but that is not of course the only interest so that's what Raymer's talking about but here's Again, one of these places, I think, where we can see, um, and this is where I was saying it feels to me like it works like a gloss on on fairy stories. Why does he talk about fairy and drama at all in on fairy stories? I mean, yeah, it's kind of an interesting sort of case study in the sense of being, 
you know, the logical extreme of the of the thing that he's describing. Um, but it's not really needed for that. Um, then we get this, right? Where he makes it sound like the experience really both reading and writing stories are influenced by what the dreaming mind does, by the fairy and dramas created, subcreated, and experienced by the dreaming mind. Um, and again, it gives us a sense. So, you know, do I think that Tolkien is saying that he has done space and time travel himself through his own dreaming mind? No, no, not exactly. Um, but I cannot help but think that here in this description, what we're getting is Tolkien... Lots of times when we have talked about Tolkien's writing process, certainly many times in our discussions of, uh, you know, the history of Middle-earth, we have talked about how Tolkien seems to describe discovering things, not inventing them, right? And, like, thinking about those, mo those moments in the composition of The Lord of the Rings, right, where he found the right thing, like when he figures out who Treebeard really is, what Treebeard really is, right? And then as soon as he does, the whole chapter just flows directly, right? When, um, uh, you know, this uh, Gondorian captain in Athelion wouldn't shut up about the history of Gondor, and he ends up, you know, discovering who Faramir is, right? Um, these different moments like this, we, you know, more recently, right, with the scouring of the Shire, Right when he discovers that it was Saruman, in fact, um, an unrepentant Saruman, uh, who was at the who was in fact Sharky. Right. Um, but whenever we've talked about that, though, 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 many times we have, um, uh, many times when we've discussed that trend, right, that tendency of Tolkien to talk like he's discovering, we have nothing to go on. About what that means. Okay, so he's just like, where is it then? Where's he getting it from? What is he claiming? What is what? What is Tolkien's understanding of the mechanism of that? Does he? Right? Is he just totally, sort of mystical about it? Right? What's the explanation? What's the? Um, how does he understand what is in fact happening there? Right? And you know, I wonder if this is at least something like a theory about that. Um, that because what we have in the character of Raymer here is somebody describing not just, not only alluding to that experience of getting a picture in your head while writing a story and um, knowing that you didn't make it up, knowing that you're getting it from somewhere, right? Um knowing that that's something that's being transmitted to you or recalled by you. Um, but, of course, in the character of Raymer, we're also getting an explanation of where it came from, right? This idea of fairy and drama happening within dreams, within the dreaming mind, and that being, perhaps, the source, a source, of this experience. Um, and... Uh, Anyway, so uh, that do, do I think that this definitely means like this is what Tolkien thought, right? Did Tolkien really feel that he had these Farian dreams where his dreaming mind was inventing these stories and he was experiencing them and he was just trying to sort of recapture those in his waking with his waking mind? Again, not saying that it's exactly autobiographical, but I can't help but wonder. Um, it seems to be an answer to a question which is there to be asked all over the place. If, okay, if you're not inventing them, where do they come from, right? Um, a question that we've not asked because there's no answer to it. At least we haven't seen anywhere else any answer to it. Well, here's an answer. Um, here's an answer, and that's interesting. Okay. I'm not doing a good job being a very efficient tonight, but there. That's all we can do. Okay. Here's a, 
arbitrary example he uses. There are good dreams, apparently of the sort I mean, quoted in books. My own were not so good. The ones I used to remember when awake, that is. They were only significant fragments, more statically pictorial, seldom dramatic, and usually without figures of, hu of, human sh of humane shape. Though I sometimes retained the memory of significant words or sentences without any scenery, such as, I am full of sovereign remedies. That seemed a wise and satisfactory utterance. I have never yet found out why. Here are some of my fragments of this kind. There is the empty throne on the top of a mountain. There is a green wave, white-crested, fluted and scallop-shaped, but vast, towering above green fields, often with a wood of trees, too, that has constantly appeared. I saw several times a scene in which a wide plain lay before the feet of a steep ridge on which I stood. The opposing sky was immense, rising as a vertical steep ridge on which I stood. The, so no, sorry. The opposing sky was immense, rising as a vertical wall, not bending to a vault, ablaze with stars strewn almost regularly over all its expanse. That is an omen or a presage of catastrophe. A dark shape sometimes passes across the sky, only seen by blotting out the stars as it goes. Then there is the tall, gray, round tower on the sheer end of the land. The sea cannot be seen, for it is too far below, too immeasurably far, but it can be smelt. And over and over again, in many stages of growth and many different lights and shadows, three tall trees, slender, foot to foot on a green mound, and crowned with an embracing halo of blue and gold. Okay, so here is Raymer explaining some of these pictures that come through to him, right? Um, yeah, Arthur, three trees on a green mound. That's right. Um, I can't help but wonder there, Arthur. I mean, that one is so conspicuous. Three tall trees, slender foot to foot on a green mound and crowned in it with an embracing halo of blue and gold. That sounds so conspicuously familiar that I can't help but wonder if he's monkeyed with the number just to make it less obviously <laughs> relevant to his own stories, right? Um, uh, it's yeah, Margaret Joyce says, the much maligned bronze tree that got left out uh, of the published deck. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm kind of wondering. Um, um, uh, yeah, well, Nancy, that misdirect doesn't work for us. But remember, we, unlike anybody else, has read the Silmarillion, right? When he was writing this, nobody knew about that. Um, uh, we are so familiar now with the image of the trees on the mound uh, that we recognize it right away. Very few people would have done, uh, uh, you know, at this time. So, um, so there's that. Um, but anyway, uh, the one which is totally not uh, disguised, um, and again, hadn't been mentioned in any published text or anything yet is the green wave. Um, and this is of course, one of the most obvious examples where, again, if you're, you know, if I'm still struggling to avoid autobiography here, uh, for Tolkien, I, this pr absolutely thwarts me in my attempt to avoid it. Right. Tolkien described himself, uh, that, he had a recurring dream of exactly this, the green wave. What he's describing here, the green wave, is his own personal recurring dream that he had many times uh, and then gave it to Faramir. And he said he actually stopped having it after he gave it to Faramir. Um, and, of course, uh, it's sort of the heart of the Numenor story, really, um, this recurring dream that he had which he didn't understand this image, um, uh, this image of the, um, uh, of the, um, of the green wave. Now, James, that's a very sensible question. He's saying, well, if it wasn't published and nobody would know about it, why would the redirect have been needed? Like, why not just say the two trees then? Um, what I'm thinking, James, is not when I say that he is, 
you know, changing the number of the trees in order to conceal that this is... I don't mean to prevent the public noticing, because again, the public wouldn't notice. How many even of the Inklings would notice? I mean, Lewis would, but, you know, he had read some of his stuff to the Inklings, but not the whole, I don't think. You know, would the Inklings recognize it? Maybe they would. Um, but... I'm not sure, James, and I don't think I could prove it. But here's my theory. I have a theory about that, James, and that is he is willing to take things from his private life experience, namely his recurring dream of the wave, and just put it wholesale exactly as he had it in this story. He seems less willing to take his stories and put it straight into this story. Or at least, let me say that a different way, James. I would be inclined to interpret if we run with the fact that those trees are the trees, right? That this picture that he's describing, is that he's describing a version of the picture that he has of the trees of Valinor. Um, why he makes it three instead of two um, there are other possibilities, right? I mean, it could be that he did have a picture of three trees and, like, decided in his stories to make it two instead. I don't think so. I'm, again, I'm inclined to think that he is changing it for this, not that he changed it in his stories, uh, uh, deviated from his pictures, especially when Raymer himself was explaining how deviating from the pictures is usually a really bad idea. If you try to fiddle with it, um, it doesn't usually come out well. Um... So I think instead he's he's masking it here. Uh, I think, yeah, Stephen. I think in some ways it reminds me a little bit about the kind of recycling that he's he does in the Hobbit, right? Um, I don't think. Remember the theory that I was espousing back in our first discussion on the Notion Club papers when we were looking at the opening stuff. How it seems. My theory was that this whole book, the Notion Club Papers, grew out of this one little thing, right? He wanted to make a critique of Peroandra uh, and read it to the Inklings and had this funny conceit of both softening the blow of his critique and also having fun with everybody concerned uh, by writing a fake Inklings meeting um, in which the discussion happens and he ends up critiquing Peroandra um, and how that just kind of grows into a story on its own. Right? It just takes on life of its own as so often happened in Tolkien's writing um, and becomes its own story. And the turning point, but the turning point from a fun fictional Inklings meeting, just written explicitly to read at an Inklings meeting um, to an independent story about space and time travel happens when Dolbear wakes up and says that Raymer's really been there, right? That's when the story becomes serious, becomes its own real story. And now we're going in this other direction. So, but nevertheless, um, looking where it's come from, I do not believe that it has yet made full contact. I don't see any evidence that it's made full contact with his, with Tolkien's world. Right, I don't see yet any evidence through what we've read that um, there's going to be direct connection between the Silmarillion world, like the characters and events and history of Tolkien's Middle Earth with the Notion Club papers. Um, it's going to get there, right? We're going to get to Numenor eventually, but I don't think we're there at Numenor yet. We're at Atlantis already, right? We're hinting at Atlantis, but I don't think we're at Numenor yet. Do you see what I mean by that distinction? Um, I hope that that makes sense. But again, that's why I think he's still... The firewall is still sort of down, right? He's still thinking about this independently. So he's drawing on this in trying to come up with examples, in order to try to give examples of these mythic images that 
bubbled up into his waking mind out of his dreaming mind, he gives several interesting examples. Um, one of them we know to be autobiographical, and this other one I suspect to be autobiographical too, but it, but altered. Because again, he doesn't want yet to connect it to uh, explicitly to the Silmarillion world. So, so yeah, so the change from three to from two to three would be in this theory, not like to feebly attempt to conceal, pay no attention to the uh, you know to Valinor, um, uh, or to hope nobody notices, but rather just to um, maintain some creative distance between his two different sort of projects. Anyway, okay. Let's keep going. Then there's more. Then Raymer starts talking about his dreaming mind not only receiving impressions from other things and therefore enabling his mind through its reception and memory of these other, like the memories of the meteor and stuff like that, going itself, experiencing other places. Not only is he talking about the dreaming mind as a sub-creative force, engaging in fairy and drama and enchantment in this way and creating stories which, images and snippets of which bubble through into his waking mind and inform his waking creative process. He also talks about encountering other things, that there are other creatures from whom he receives messages or with whom he has encounters of some kind, right? And so these next two slides are about those. But out of some place beyond the region of dreams, beyond the region of dreams, now and again there comes a blessedness, and it soaks through all the levels and illumines all the scenes through which the mind passes out back into waking, and so it flows out into this life. There it lasts long, but not forever in this world, and memory cannot reach its source. Often we ascribe it to the pictures seen on the margin, radiant in its light, as we pass by and out. But a mountain far in the north, caught in a slow sunset, is not sun. Whew. Okay. So, there is something beyond the region of dreams. Again, here he is talking about an encounter with something. And from there, now and again, there comes a blessedness which soaks through this influence. Um, this is a, a risky thing to say, but I'll say it anyway. And again, I want to frame this cautiously. Many of you have engaged on one side or other of the debate about the extent to which The Lord of the Rings is a Christian book, right? Many of you have, again, what, which, on one side or the other of the debate, there are many people who say, no, it's not really essentially Christian. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's not, and people who want to, like, make it, a Christian story or, you know, twisting it for their own motivations. Others are, you know, say it's a very thoroughly Christian uh, and religious story. Of course, Tolkien himself said that, but he doesn't really explain what that means. At the same time that he says that, he's also like, there's no religion, and I, you know, don't talk, I try not to talk about God. And so, uh, and also I don't like allegory and everything else. So, you know, while at the, one of the things that is so challenging in trying to understand what Tolkien means when he says that the Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic story, uh, is that he'll, he asserts that, but then he sort of kicks out all of the, you know, if we try to find some ground to stand on to explain what he means by that and the sense in which the Lord of the Rings is uh, a deeply Catholic and religious story, um, Tolkien seems to kick out the supports but beneath a bunch of those, right? Um, 
Uh, but it, but it is you know it's, it's yes it's it's a, a fundamentally religious story but it doesn't talk about religion religion doesn't happen in it we never discuss God and uh, also okay so fine but there's um uh, but there's um uh, but you could read it allegorically okay so that's probably it right so symbolically it's deeply religious and then Tolkien's like no. No, that's not it either, right? Frodo is not Jesus. Gandalf is not Jesus. That's not how it works. It's not that kind of story either. And so it's really hard to understand the sense in which the Lord of the Rings, in which Tolkien understands the Lord of the Rings to be a fundamentally religious Christian Catholic story. Um, uh yeah, no, Arthur, it absolutely can be read either way. The point is, Tolkien said this, right? So trying to understand how he understood that. That's what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about how Tolkien understood that to be true. Um, if it's not explicitly Christian, and it's not allegorically Christian, what is it? How is it? And I'm not saying there aren't any ways to talk about this, but... But it's an interesting question, right? So here's the risky thing I want to say. Try this on out for size. Right? Try applying this passage. Out of some place beyond the region of dreams, now and again, there comes a blessedness, and it soaks through all the levels, and illumines all the scenes through which the mind passes out back into waking, and so it flows out into this life. There it lasts long, but not forever in this world, and memory cannot reach its source. What if that is something like the way in which the Lord of the Rings is a deeply religious Christian and Catholic story? Um, what if that is something closer to the way in which Tolkien himself understands? Right? Um, this blessedness that comes from some place beyond the region of dreams soaks through all the levels which is kind of vague right soaks through all the levels and illumines all the scenes through which the mind passes out back into waking um, notice also A mountain far in the north, caught in a slow sunset, is not sun. The story isn't about the sun, but it's about a mountain in the far north caught in a slow sunset. And so therefore, it very much is about the sun. But you don't actually see the sun in the picture. You see the mountain in the far north, caught in a slow sunset, right? Um, anyway, as I said, somewhere in the middle between definite conviction of his own beliefs and theories and between mere fiction on the other side, right? Um, so I don't want to be too assertive about this, but... Let me say only then, let me finish this then just by saying, this helps me. Um, even just under using this description as a metaphor really helps me to understand what? The flavor of how Tolkien imagines. Uh, stories interacting with God, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah. Bruce, that's a really good... I don't want to talk about that too much because it's a fairly obscure reference, but I agree with you. Um, uh, Bruce thinking about uh, uh, a reference in C.S. Lewis in uh, his book Re Reflections on the Psalms, which I'm going to be reading soon, Bruce. I'm doing a C.S. Lewis read-through, and I'm almost up to Reflections on the Psalms again. Um, but anyway, um, uh, about the story of Christ 
reflecting and refracting through stories in all cultures. Yeah, ex- that it's similar to that. Uh, not exactly the same, but similar, I do think. Um, anyway, okay. Um, yes, now, Arthur, you're absolutely right. And you're, d- that's exactly one of the main things that I'm hitting on here. Arthur says, yet one can read this passage and see almost any religion, not specifically Christianity slash Catholicism, even though I know where Tolkien himself was coming from. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's exactly it, right? Raymer is describing this, not even encounter with, that's not quite right, influence from, this blessedness, right? This influence from some place beyond the region of dreams. And there is a sense in which this blessedness is transcribing, transcribing, uh, transcending, that's what I mean, transcending religion, right? Any specific thing. This is a more direct encounter. Yes, Kit, this is the light of heaven shining in and illuminating things. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. Okay, but it's unfortunately not merely blessedness uh, that he, um, uh, Raymer, encounters. Aren't some of the visitors malicious, said Jeremy? Don't evil minds attack you ever in sleep, he asks casually. (laughs) Do you ever get assaulted by evil minds in your dreams? Um, I expect so, said Raymer. They're always on the watch, asleep or awake but they work more by deceit than attack. I don't think they are specially active in sleep. Less so, probably. I fancy they find it easier to get at us awake, distracted and not so aware. The body's a wonderful lever for an indirect influence on the mind, and deep dreams can be very remote from its disturbance. Anyway, I've very little experience of that kind, thank God. But there does sometimes come a frightening, a sort of knocking at the door, It doesn't describe it, but that'll have to do. I think that is one of the ways in which that horrible sense of fear arises. A fear that doesn't seem to reside in the remembered dream situation at all, or wildly exceeds it. Okay. Um. Uh, remind me, Bruce or somebody else who knows, what's the publication date on Screw Tape Letters? The first first edition of the Screw Tape Letters was published when? Uh, somebody remind me of that date. I'm, I'm, I don't remember it off the top of my head. Um, okay. So what is Tolkien talking about here? He's talking about temptation. He's talking about demonic temptation. Right? When he says, when he's talking about they, he's talking about demons. They are always on the watch, asleep or awake. But they work more by deceit than attack. 1942. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much. Screw Tape Letters published in 1942, so just a couple years before this. Yes. Um, and you'll remember that C.S. Lewis dedicated Screw Tape Letters to Tolkien, which I always thought was a bit of a joke on his part, actually. I thought that was... Uh, uh, I thought he was kind of teasing Tolkien, but I, I can I can imagine that Tolkien rolled his eyes and laughed when he saw that the Screw Tape Letters was dedicated to him. Um, but anyway, um, he says he doesn't think they demons are specially active in sleep. Less so, probably. Now, notice he's not used the word demon. I'm using it to try to like evil minds is what he's talked about, right? But there are these evil minds out there, always on the watch. They work more by deceit than attack. They're not specially active in sleep. It's not a dreaming phenomenon. And he suggests they're less active to the dreaming mind than the waking mind. They find it easier to get at us when we're awake because we're distracted and we're not as aware. In our dreaming mind, we're much more aware of their presence. And they can use, while we're awake our body as a wonderful lever for an indirect influence on the mind. Deep dreams can be very remote from the body's disturbance. Um, And then his description of the frightening, the knocking at the door. 
that sometimes these evil minds do approach in dreams. And you are aware of their approach. You don't encounter them, right? So just as there is a blessedness that comes from the place beyond dreams, sometimes there is a frightening that comes, right? This sense of fear, a fear that doesn't seem to reside in the remembered dream situation at all, or wildly exceeds it. Um, so what are we supposed to take from this? One of the things that I think that we take from both of these last two slides is this sense of, remember, the whole concept behind Raymer's discussion in the first place is the machine for actual travel in time and space, right? Um, and in that context, he is describing how through the dreaming mind, they're asking him questions, and he is describing how there is actual encounter with objective reality. There are beings out there. The blessedness comes from somewhere. There are evil minds out there. Um, and you can be... Uh, you can be, you can come into contact with them. That does happen. Um, this is not just, on the one hand, this is a reminder that all this discussion about dreaming, it might be easy for us to fall into the mistake of thinking that it's all purely subjective, right? Um, it's not. Remember that the whole concept is that the dreaming mind is the machine for actual perception, for real uh, uh, experience, right? The mind, the dreaming mind, can actually travel and see these other places and times. Um, there is encounter with things that really are there outside the self. Um, yeah. Um, Rachel, he doesn't describe any other results of these encounters. Remember, he says he doesn't have many experiences with this. Thank God, right? Um, but yes, the... the um, remember how he was saying, when you have a memory, you know, one of those pictures that floats into your head, it's probably something that's coming from your dreaming mind, right? like a story your dreaming mind was writing, was experiencing. Um, sometimes some of the experiences that you have in dreams are happening because you are your dreaming mind is actually encountering something outside you, right? Um, and so therefore that, that sense of when you are suddenly gripped with fear, which is, which either wildly exceeds the fear that which should be, you know, stimulated by the dream experience or is totally irrelevant to the dream. You know, if you're in a dream which seems perfectly innocent, but all of a sudden you are, comp you are terrified, that's not because... That's th that fear does not have its source. The significance of that emotion is not in the full story that your dreaming mind is telling. It's irrelevant to the story. It's an imposition on the story almost a hijacking of the story because at that moment in the dream you are encountering this other mind, this evil mind. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. And it keeps going. The one I told you about, Green Emberu, where there was a kind of organic life, rich but wholesome and long evil, that was where I landed when I first fell wide asleep. It seems a long while ago now. It is still very vivid to me, or was until last week, he sighed. I cannot remember the original again somehow, not when awake. I have an idea that writing these memories up, retelling them in waking life and terms, in waking life and terms, blurs or erases them in waking memory, overlays them into palimpsests. One can't have it both ways. Either one must bear the pains of not communicating what one greatly desires to share, or one must remain content with the translation. 
I wrote that account for you, and all I'll have now is that, and stirrings and faint traces of what lies beneath, the vision of Emberu. Translation. So we talked about translation last time. The translation comes in, in part, your dreaming mind is kind of translating for your waking mind, or your waking mind, perhaps, thinking about it the other way, is trying to translate what your dreaming mind is giving it, um, or allowing it to re recall. But this is an, a more uh, sort of significant um, uh, act of translation, right? When he tells the stories, when he takes... So he has these pictures, these whole... Not just isolated pictures, right? As he gets deeper and deeper into this and, and, and more and more attuned to his dreaming mind, he can explore the whole story, right? He, 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 he sees all the, all the stories his dreaming mind does. He has his travels. But his dreaming mind's experiences of them are not in normal language. It's not a narrative, right? It's this whole, right? It's this, like, organic thing that is in his mind. And if he translates that into words, if he tells the story in a way that enables him to communicate it to other people, then he can't go back to that original experience. It translates it permanently. You see what I mean? Um, yeah, Karina, this does seem to me a pretty good description of how memories work, too. Right? Um, and this strikes me as one of the things... I mean, surely... Surely many of you have had this experience as well, right? Think of a memory from your childhood, which you've retold many times, right? You've told this story from your childhood many times. Have you ever had that experience where you're talking with, like, a sibling or your parent or somebody like that who also experienced that memory, who was there at the time, and they remember it differently? Sometimes the differences in remembering, I think, are just due to the fact of, like, you know, they weren't inside your head, right? So they didn't experience it the same way. Um, you know, that uh, our, you know, w ways in which our memories are sort of inescapably self-centered, right? Because we are always the primary actors generally in our memories. But, um, but it's not... Uh, but there are times... I think it's not just that. There are definitely many times when... I think I've had exactly the experience that he's describing here. Having told the story, having turned this memory into words, I'm stuck with that now. That is the memory. I don't have any more the original memory as it was before I turned it into the story. Now I have the story that I've told. Um, and when somebody else translates it differently, right then it's different, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the memory for them becomes, uh, becomes a different thing. Uh, yeah, Mary's talking about how that happened with a, uh, um, with a, a long-term friend, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I think this is something that is really interesting. And notice that the chain, the, the choice here that Raymer describes. He has had this sort of, this experience that he longed for, Right of traveling, of seeing these other things. He has done space and he has, he has performed space and time travel, but remember, he was interested in doing that for narrative purposes. This all started with a desire to tell stories. Right? That's where he began. And he can still do it, but if he does, then the story becomes the memory. One can't have it both ways. Either one must bear the pains of not communicating what one greatly desires to share, or one must remain content with translation. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Carrie points out that uh, distilling the real into words dilutes the real and locks it out of memory. Yeah, and Carita points out that this can be a good thing uh, uh, with a bad memory. Um, you can get some distance and make it more manageable by telling someone when you are safe. I, I absolutely agree. I do think it's a big part of why um, like therapy is good, why talking about traumatic experiences can be really good, right? Because you do take this that thing, that memory, right, which itself on its own in that state is, you know, harmful, right? Uh, and you you make it into a story. It changes it. Um, yeah, I that seems to me to fit with my, you know, very limited experience understanding of that. I'm not trying to claim great, uh, uh, you know, counseling experience or anything like that. Uh, but um, but yeah, that seems to me to fit with what I have personally experienced with that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Um, but notice again, um, notice again, the fundamental desire to share, to communicate, right? That's there. Um, that storytelling impulse is still a fundamental one. So that either way, it's a loss. You can't have it both ways, right? Um, you're either going to lose the pure experience or you're never going to be able to share it. And neither one is a great option. Um, yeah. Um, okay. It's the same with Elor. Elor, he murmured. Elor Eshurizel. I drew it once in words as best I could, and now it is words. That immense plain with its silver floor all delicately patterned, the shapely cliffs and convoluted hills, the whole world was designed with such loveliness, not of one thought, but of many in harmony, though in all its shapes there was nowhere any to recall what we call organic life. Their, their inanimate nature was orderly, symmetrical, unconfused, yet intricate, Beyond my mind's unraveling, in its flowing modulations and recollections, a garden, a paradise of water, metal, stone, like the interwoven variations of vast natural orders of flowers, a surezel, blue, white, silver, gray, blushing to rich purples were its themes, in which a glint of red was like an apocalyptic vision of essential redness, and a green gleam of gold was like the glory of the sun. And there was music, too, for there were many streams, water abundant, or some fairer counterpart, less wayward, more skilled in the enchantment of light and in the making of innumerable sounds. There the great waterfall of Osho Kulosh fell down its three hundred steps in a sequence of notes and chords of which I can only hear faint echoes now. I think the Enkeladim dwell there. This is an amazing picture. Um, here is Raymer giving an example of what he's talking about. He had this vision. He had this experience. He saw with his dreaming mind this world, Elor, Elor Eshurizel, and the great waterfall of Osho Kulosh. Osho Kulosh. What a wonderful name for a waterfall. Um, he had this experience, and he described it, and he gives us some of the description here, right? Um, and you can see on the one hand, he is succeeding in communicating, right? He is painting a wonderful picture, um, a wonderfully non-static picture, a wonderfully not merely visual picture, right, of this incredible world. Um, and it's amazing and it's intricate and it's moving and it's alive but now it's words right now it's a description now that experience that he had of it is gone or rather is now f forever limited to the channels that he is you know so 
Like, think about blue, white, silver, gray, blushing to rich purples, right? Clearly, even just the fact of the list of colors, right, is an inadequate, um, is an inadequate uh, uh, attempt to capture the color palette, right, all of the different colors of the world. Um, those single words, the word white, the word blue, right? There's so many things that can be pointed at with those two words, right? So it's, again, it, it sort of demonstrates how inadequate the words are in order to, to capture this picture. And yet it does capture something of it. Um, uh, and yet it loses it at the same time. Stephen asks if uh, speaking in Old Entish would strengthen or weaken this effect. Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I wonder, Stephen, if you could understand Old Entish as a way of trying to... I don't know. I almost want to say temporize with this effect, right? On the one hand, um, to put things into words, any words, even many long words, um, is to limit it in this way. But if your words are sufficiently unhasty, right, if the story that you tell, if the name of a thing is the story of its, is, is its whole story, right, then you're getting more, maybe? I don't know. Um, but, um, Anyway, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, notice also the picture here that he's getting of Elor Eshurizel is just of the world. Notice what he's not giving us here when he's trying to give us an example. Narrative. Like, nothing happens. It's not a drama. It's not a story. There aren't characters. It's not about people. Um, so, take that, Aristotle. No plot, no, no, uh, no, no ethos, and uh, no logos, right? There you go. No, no, no plot, no characters uh, needed. Um, it's just the world itself, right? Now, notice it's not just a, an empty world. He says, I think the Enkeladim dwell there. But it's not a, this is not a story about the Enkeladim. This is just the story that is Elor Eshurizel. Um, yeah, Carita says, with atmosphere like this, we can be plot optional. Sure. But of course, you know what else I can't help but think of when I read this? All those landscape descriptions in the Lord of the Rings, right? And we talked about it in the context of, you know, the history of the Lord of the Rings as being, you know, an expression of Tolkien as visual artist. You know, how these visual pictures were clearly some of the, the fundamental building blocks of the story that he was telling. Here we see a rather more extreme version of that same kind of thing. Um, and, of course, Raymer's even going to go on to talk about this. Uh come back to that in a couple of slides. Uh, he makes a reference to the Fields of Arbol. Um, fields of Arbol, said Laudum. I seem to have heard that before. Where do you get these names from? Whose language are they? Now that would really interest me, rather than geometry and landscape. I should use my chances, if ever I got into such a state, for language history, says Laudum, the philologist. Arbol is old solar for the sun, said Jeremy. Do you mean, Raymer, that you can get back to old solar and that Lewis did not merely invent those words? Right, so, of course, old solar is the language... This is from uh, Lewis's space trilogy, from, from Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra, especially from Paralandra, um, that there's a language which is like the original language of the universe, um, the fundamental language... Uh, of which every other language is is, is merely a, a sort of corruption, right? Uh, which is old solar. Words like castles coming out of your mouth. I love that description from that hideous strength. Um, 
Uh, and the field of our ball is what he calls the solar system. Our ball is the sun, and the field of our ball is what what he calls the solar system uh, in uh, in Paralandra. So um, he so here is Raymer using Lewis's vocabulary, and so note Jeremy's interest here. Right, Jeremy says, "Do you mean that Lewis did not merely invent the old solar is real?" Lewis was writing history? That was true? Old Solar? said Raymer. Well, no. But of course I was quoting Lewis in saying Fields of Arbol. As to the other names, that's another matter. They're as firmly associated with the places and visions in my mind as bread is with bread in your minds and mine. But I think they're my names in a sense in which the word bread is not. Um... Okay, so now notice Loudham, the philologist, is really interested, right? Uh, like, can you hear languages? Can you get at language histories uh, through this technique? I dare say it depends on personal tastes and talents, but although I'm a philologist, uh, this is still Raymer speaking here, I think I should find it difficult to learn strange languages in a free dream or vision. That's a fascinating thing for Tolkien to say. So, you wouldn't? learn the languages? You can learn in dreams, of course, but in the case of real visions of new things, you don't... T uh, in the case of real visions of new things, you don't talk or need to. You get the meaning of minds, if you meet any, more directly. If I had a vision of some alien people, even if I heard them talking, their sense would drown or blur my reception of their sounds. And when I woke up, if I remembered what had been said and tried to relate it, it would come out in English. So here's Tolkien through Raymer suggesting that in dream, right, in these dream experiences, he doesn't experience language at all. Communication, if communication happens, happens directly, mind to mind. Even if you are overhearing the conversation of somebody else, you will understand it. And you won't be able to remember the language that they're speaking. Um, yeah. So, well, Carrie, we'll talk more about this. Carrie is saying this is where Tolkien's vehicle is breaking down for her, uh, directly transferred thought without interpretation or translation. Yeah, well, well, we'll more on that in a minute here. Um, but this is remarkable. The recollection of the space trilogy here, Fields of Arbol and Old Solar and all that, of course should make us think if we know Lewis's space trilogy, especially of Out of the Silent Planet, the first of Lewis's space trilogy, um, where he is, his protagonist is a philologist, right? Um, so his protagonist is a philologist and goes to Mars and at Mar he meets a Martian and he has this moment when he first realizes that the noise that this creature who's not a, who's not anthropomorphic is making uh, is a word, right? When he realizes that it's language. Uh, and he, as a philologist, has this, like, light bulb moment, and he's like, oh my god, and he is immediately fantasizing about writing a, 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 a Malachandrian grammar, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you, know, so, d you know, his fascination in trying to learn how the Malachandrian language works. It's really fun, and of course we get a bunch of uh, a bunch more about as he sort of works out the language, and of course he learns to speak it over the next couple months. That he ends up staying with these people. Um, so one of the things that I personally am most interested to hear about Tolkien's response to the space trilogy is what he makes of the philology stuff. Now, in one of his letters, in of course a letter to the publisher in which he's promoting out of the Silent Planet, he speaks highly of this. You know, he says that he thinks that Lewis, um, you know, he says that it's, in his opinion, a pretty great blemish of a lot of science fiction that they just um, skip over the whole language issue. And I would say Tolkien is absolutely right about this. 
and that uh, what's more, science fiction has definitely not ceased just you know uh, just skipping over the language question, right? As we get you know whether it's the Universal Translator in Star Trek or whether it's the the TARDIS uh, uh, telepathic translation field or whatever, or the, or the the Babelfish, right? The most comical version uh, in Douglas Adams. All of these things. Um, um, but um, anyway, so on the one hand, Tolkien says all that kind of thing is, is, is no good. Lewis at least is dealing with the philology of it. And then here he is commenting on this directly. And the first thing he says is, yeah, no, no, when I, uh, if I encounter aliens and I'm hearing them speak, I can't even, I, I can't even remember their languages. Now, remember, it makes sense in the context of what he's been saying. Remember the translation thing, translating memory into story, right? You put it into words and it's in those words now. If he tries to relate the conversation that he hears in his dream, he understands what they're saying. And if he tries to explain it, he's going to explain it in English. And then it's English. He's not going to remember the phonemes that actually came out of their mouth in such a way that he could actually reconstruct their languages. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Bruce, I did a whole session on that. The uh, uh, Darmok, the, the Star Trek Next Generation episode where... Uh, Picard meets the alien race that speaks only in in uh, uh, in, in in metaphor and illusion. Um, yeah, that's uh, somewhere. It's on our YouTube channel. It was a special I did in one of our webathons two years ago, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Love that episode. Anyway, um, so um, translation. We'll come back to the language issue here. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this. More about Old Solar. I dare say that you, this is still Raymer, I dare say that you, Ari, Loudham, that is, are more phonetical and more sound sensitive than I am. But I think even you would find it difficult to keep your ear memory of the alien words unblurred by the impact of the direct meaning in such dreams. So again, within the dream, he experiences the direct meaning of what they're trying to communicate. And therefore, it's very difficult to keep your ear memory of the alien words. If you did, then very likely it would be only the sounds and not the sense that you'd remember, right? So again, you, you can't have it both ways, right? You have to choose. And yet, especially far away outside this world of speech, where no voices are heard and other naming has not reached, I seem to hear fragments of language and names that are not of this country. Let's unpack that for a second. Especially far away outside this world of speech, where no voices are heard. So, okay. So, Tolkien, you're saying language is just isn't a thing, right? You just ever you automatically understand what everybody means. You speak mind to mind, no language needed. You translate it into your own language when you make it into a story and recall it and recount it. So language is irrelevant in dreams. A shocking thing for Tolkien to say it would seem at first, right? But wait, oh, but there's more. Outside the world of speech. So the interesting thing about language, okay. The really cool languages are the languages that no one is speaking. People talking in a language, that's not the most interesting thing. In fact, that's not a very interesting thing at all, as it turns out. You won't even remember that. No, the real language is outside the world of speech where no voices are heard. Get away from voices. Get away from speakers, right? Now you're really cooking with gas when it comes to hearing language, right? where other naming has not reached. I seem to hear fragments of language and names that are not of this country. So he has an encounter with language, which in some sense transcends people speaking it. Notice the parallel. It seems to me anyway that there's a parallel there. 
um, between uh, uh, the way that you you have the sort of pure experience memory of the dream and then you translate it and turn it into words, right? So here we have this sort of pure encounter with language, with names, detached from words, detached from speech, right? If no voices are heard, then you can have this more profound encounter with language itself. Yes, yes, said Loudham. That's just what I want to hear about. What language is it? You say not old solar? No, said Raymer, because there isn't any such tongue. Now, so Loudham was hoping, remember the, the philological theory, right, behind Lewis's world, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the space trilogy world, is that there is this primeval language, right? That old solar is the original language, like the, 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 the fundamental language of the cosmos, which is the origin of all other languages, right? And that's what Laudam wants. Laudam is like, oh, are you saying that you can encounter, like, the base language of the universe? Um, I see it's like, you know, can you... What language is it, right? You know, is it... Uh, uh, you know, is it actually Finnish? Um, uh, you say it's not old solar, right? Um, no, said Raymer, because there isn't any such tongue. So there he's saying, like, it's not, it's not, there is not a primeval language. So he's fundamentally disagreeing with Lewis's entire philological construction. I'm sorry to disagree with your authorities, Jeremy, that is Lewis, but that is my opinion. And by the way, speaking as a philologist, I should say that the treatment of language, intercommunication, and tales of travel through space or time is a worse blemish as a rule than the cheap vehicles that we were discussing last week. Very little thought or attention is ever given to it. I think Ari will agree with me there. Right? Okay, so he disagrees with Lewis. Um... He does not believe that any primeval language... It's not just that the primeval language isn't really old solar. It's just that there is no such language at all. There isn't any such tongue. So he talks about hearing fragments of language and names that are not of this country um, outside the world of speech, but there isn't a primeval tongue. Okay, so how does it work? like this. Well, if you really want to know what these names are, said Raymer, I think they're my native language. But that is English, surely, said Laudam. Though you were born in Madagascar or some strange place? No, you ass. I have no idea how to pronounce this word. Uh, Magyarorzak? Magyarorzak? I don't know. It's, it's, uh, 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 you know, uh, Slavic and therefore doubtless nothing like what it looks like. Um, but anyways, I have no idea how to say that. Uh, that is Hungary, said Raymer. But anyway, English is not my native language, nor yours either. We each have a native language of our own, at least potentially. In working dreams, people who have a bent that way may work on it, develop it. Some, many more than you'd think, try to do the same in waking hours with varying degrees of awareness. It may be no more than giving a personal twist to the shape of old words. It may be the invention of new words on received models as a rule, or it may come to the elaboration of beautiful languages of their own in private, in private only because other people are naturally not very interested. But the inherited, first learned language, what is usually miscalled native, bites in early and deep. So the inherited first learned language, that would be what is called your native language, right? So English for most of us, right? Japanese, I know for you, Takako. Uh, whatever language you grew up speaking is this inherited first learned language. And that language bites in early and deep. But there is a language that you have which predates your true native language. There is a language which is your language. 
everybody has a native language, which is not their mother tongue. And it comes out. In working dreams, people who have a bent that way may work on it, develop it. Some people in their creative dreams don't just write stories. They develop their native language. But the inherited first learned language, what is usually miscalled native, bites in early and deep. It is hardly possible to escape from its influence. And later learned languages also affect the natural style, coloring a man's linguistic taste, like, for instance, Finnish or Welsh might do to somebody, for instance. The earlier learned, the more so, as Magyar does mine, strongly, but all the more strongly, I think, because it is in many ways closer to my own native predilections than English is. In language invention, though you may seem to build only out of material taken from other acquired tongues, it is those elements most near to your native style that you select. Okay. Um... So, um, yeah, Nancy, there's no primeval language historically, but there is psychologically. Mm, yes and no. Um, not a universal one. That's the point, right? What he is primarily disagreeing with Lewis about is this idea that there's a single language, right? That there is a tongue, a language which everybody used to speak, which you can still learn, like people in Lewis's Space Trilogy learn that language. Um, and that's like the true language, the root language, the original language. And Tolkien is saying there is no one original language. Everybody has their own native language. So it's not true historically, it's true psychologically, yes, but not. it's not universal. Um... Yeah. Um, oh, and Devora, I agree with you. This country, on the previous slide, um, names not of this country does seem a weird way of saying it. Um, yeah, that is a weird way of saying it. Um, and Timothy, yes, one of the things that he's responding to here is not just Lewis and Out of the Silent Planet, but of course one of the you know, uh, Proto-Indo-European, of course, is a constructed, a reconstructed language uh, which philologists theorized by trying to trace backwards the change in languages to try to find the root language from which all modern languages derived, right? Or at least almost most of modern languages derived. Um, Tolkien is not necessarily opposing that philological project, um, but he is, so I don't think he's not a disagreeing with like the whole trend of, uh, you know, modern philology of his time necessarily, I think, um, better philologists than I might correct me on that, but I don't think he's differing with the mainstream theories here, but what he is saying is something a little bit more mystic than that. Um, that is this idea that everybody has their own native language. And of course, this is another one of those passages where you just cannot help um, hearing autobiography, right? How does the native language come out, right? Um, how can you tell what your native language is? through the language invention process. What language are you drawn towards, right? Um, uh, it may come to the elaboration of beautiful languages of their own in private, right? The secret vice, right? The, uh, the invention of language turns out, of course, not to be an invention of language, but a discovery. Remember in The Lost Road about how, uh, I think it's uh, Alboin, right? At the beginning of The Lost Road, 
has these sort of dream-like experiences where he keeps hearing these, these words keep coming through, is the phrase he uses to him, right? And, he, and he, he thinks he knows what these words mean, right? There we got one sense of what this, like, discovery of language was, that he was not making, he's not inventing the language, he's discovering the language. But in The Lost Road, he is... Um, uh, He's receiving it, or he's hearing it from somewhere else, right? It's somebody else's language, and it's but it's not actually personal to him. Here, we have a similar thing, but it's at a kind of a higher metaphysical level, right? Um, where everybody has their own native language, and some people aren't really aware of it, and it gets kind of drowned out by their mother tongue, right? Um, but it still can come through, and it comes through most directly through uh, uh, through language invention. But again, like when you, I, I can't get away from Tolkien's own biography in hearing him talking about this, right? Um, later learned languages also affect the natural style, coloring a man's linguistic taste. Um, Magyar, one of his... He, so English was his native language, I think he's saying. Um, uh, and that, yes, I think he's citing Magyar as one of the learned languages, the later learned languages that he uh, learned later in life. Um, and he's saying that it colors strongly his linguistic taste. But why that language? He knows many languages, why that language in particular? Why does he love Magyar in particular? Why does the sound of Magyar um, particularly appeal to him? And his answer is because it is closer to his own native predilections than English is. And I get, doesn't this sound exactly like Tolkien's own expressed experience with Welsh and even more so with Finnish? Right, he hears Finnish, and he—it sounds like his native language. Right, it sounds like this—the language that he is discovering. Right. Um, again, not saying this is Tolkien's actual experience, but this idea that everybody has a native language. Right, that everybody has, that there is a language which is unique to everybody, seems to me like one of those supposals, perhaps, that he's sort of putting out there here. Oh, here you go, Devora. getting back to the countries question. Voiceless countries, said Jeremy? You mean regions where there is nothing like our human language? Yes, said Raymer. Language properly so called, as we know it on Earth. Token perceived by sense, plus significance for the mind. Okay, so notice his, he's defining, when he talks about language, he's talking about those two things. There is a token, the external thing, which your senses perceive. Usually speech, right? Verbal speech. But, like, sign language and written language are both included here, right? Things that you, a sign that you perceive through only your eyes, right? But it's a it's a token, right? That thing that you that your sense takes in, and there's a significance that is communicated to your mind, right? So we've got the physical token and the mental or spiritual significance. Those two things together, the marriage of those two things, that's what language is. If you have only tokens and no significance, you don't have language, you just have noise. Right? If you have significance without tokens, then you don't, again, have language. You have a direct telepathic link, right? Um, you have a mind meld. You don't have language, right? Those two things. He says, those things, that is peculiar to an embodied mind, an essential characteristic, the prime characteristic of the fusion of incarnation. Only now, to use Jeremy's Lewisian word again, would have language. The irrational couldn't, 
and the unembodied couldn't or wouldn't. Voiceless countries are countries without people in them. So back to, what was it, Elor? Right, that landscape that he described, in which he was describing no people, right? There is language there, but it's beyond speech. So there is something that is like language, but it's not language as we call it. What we think of as language, token plus significance, is peculiar to an embodied mind. This um, parallel right, between the nature of language, physical token, spiritual significance brought together. B that parallel between that and physical embodiment, spiritual soul, physical body, right, the spiritual being embodied in a physical person, right, and those two things combined into an incarnate human or elf or whatever, right, alien, um, those two things are linked. Only incarnate people, people who have both spirit and body, would do language. That's not to say that... So, and so something that only had body, right, that wasn't rational, wouldn't... Uh, it, it couldn't, right? It couldn't communicate. It's got nothing to communicate. And if you had a spirit which didn't have a body, it wouldn't use language. But spirits are often recorded as speaking, said Frankly. I know, Raymer answered, but I wonder if they really do, or if they make you hear them, just as they can also make you see them in some appropriate form, by producing a direct impression on the mind. The clothing of this naked impression in terms intelligible to your incarnate mind is, I imagine, often left to you, the receiver. Though no doubt they can cause you to hear words and to see shapes of their choosing if they will. But in any case, the process would be the reverse of the normal in a way. Outwards, a translation from meaning into symbol. The audible and in invisible results might be hardly distinguishable from the normal even so, except for some inner emotion, though there is in fact sometimes a perceptible difference of sequence. <laughs> this is complicated. So... Spirits without bodies are often recorded as speaking, frankly points out. So how can you say that language, token plus significance, is unique to incarnate creatures? God speaks to Moses, right, um, when he's not in a body. So how does that happen? How could he do that? Why would he do that? Um, Raymer says, not sure it does actually happen that way. Right, It might feel that way. We might think that that's what's happening. But if we received a direct, um, a direct impression on our mind, right? if something were being communicated directly in our mind, we would probably translate it into language, just like that translation of memory or dream into story, right? When we, because we are incarnate, you know, the... The, uh, the transmitter isn't incarnate, and so might be transmitting directly, but the receiver, us, right, we are incarnate, and so we're going to receive it. We're going to translate it when it gets to us into incarnate language, token plus significance. So we'll, we'll receive the significance, and we will fill in the tokens, uh, because that's how we roll, right? So sometimes he says that might just be us, translating. Other times it is possible that just as a spirit can choose to become visible, right? To be, can, can give itself a form, can affect our eyes in such a way that it transmits a picture of itself so that we can see it. So too, it could also affect our ears such that we could hear actual words. But even that, he says, that's still sort of translating. That would be like reverse translating. Um, instead of receiving tokens and translating that into significance, understanding the meaning of the words that you're hearing, right? You would have a spirit 
uh, uh, sort of transmitting significance, but translating that into tokens for you. Um, the audible and visible results might be hardly distinguishable from the normal, even so. So that is, in a dream, like if you're having an encounter with a spirit in a dream, you may remember a conversation, right? Um, but he's doubting that real language is actually happening there, right? Um, and he says, although it's going to sound and feel like language, it's... Um, it's going to be hard to distinguish from, from, but yet it's not going to be normal. And sometimes, in fact, sometimes there's a perceptible difference of sequence, he says. I understand that to mean if you're a language professional, you'll be able to tell, right? If what you're getting is this kind of fake <laughs> language, right? Um, if what you're getting is a spiritual being faking language, in order to communicate with you, you'll be able to tell the difference if you're aware of it, right? Um, if you listen carefully, you can tell the difference. Um, and there might be a, a sort of disjunction between the, um, uh, between the, what the, 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 the motion and the, between the inner emotion and the, uh, uh, the message, the language, the significance. Um, yeah, Stephen says it's it's like how you can see the photoshopped bit in a picture. Uh, sometimes even in a really well photoshopped picture. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, again, if you're careful, if you're paying attention, uh, and if you know a lot about pictures, especially, uh, then you'll uh, maybe notice. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh. Thomas, I think as far as the application to like animals in general, no. Again, he would include, uh, uh, you know, uh, only now. Uh, irrational animals would not have language in this way. Um, yeah. So he would he would exclude by s saying the irrational couldn't. I believe he is excluding uh, animals from this kind of language. Okay. Um, it's getting late. Let's see. Yeah, let's stop there. We're still not quite done with this. This is super complicated. Uh, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I really want to go through this because this is... Do you see the fruit of this? Right? Um, understanding Raymer's narrative here understanding this literary mechanism slash travel machine that Raymer is trying to explain. That's um, all well and good and uh, an interesting thing to try to do in itself. Um, I think on that level, I don't think anyone would say that the Notion Club Papers is itself a super effective story independently on that level, right? I mean, like, this is not exactly gripping narrative, and it's really hard to follow, and it's super abstract and difficult in lots of ways. Like, this isn't exactly a page-turner so far, right? Um, but it is really interesting, right? Really interesting to see some of his ideas, and, and especially to get these moments where it just, it sounds so much like we are hearing... I feel like I am learning more here from this passage, even though there are still a lot of things I don't feel I'm perfectly understanding. But I feel like I am I am learning so much about how Tolkien thinks of language. That idea of language encountering real language, your own native language, out beyond the realm of speech. You know... That was pretty far off my personal radar screen, right? But thinking about that really helps me to understand Tolkien's own relationship with language and thoughts about language. Okay. Um, good. Well, I'm going to wrap up here. Looks like I'm actually 
having, well, briefly was having internet problems there. Uh, so sorry about that. Okay, I know I froze for a second. But um, anyway, this is, um, uh, as I say, this is fascinating stuff. Um, I hope that you guys are enjoying the things that we're able to learn. We'll tr I'll try to kind of step back from it and put some things together at the end here when we do get to the end of this. And then we'll get into the more narrative-driven elements, the more plot-driven er elements, I should say, uh, of the Notion Club papers uh, soon after this. Uh, so keep reading forward from here. We're not going to spend another whole week on this section uh, of Raymer's uh, discussion, so we're, we are going to move on to the next uh, part. Uh, after um, uh, after today, so so do go ahead and read the next assigned reading. Um, uh, we'll finish this up and and then we'll get into that next time. So thanks very much everybody for joining me. Um, I'll be back next week tomorrow night. We've got film film again, uh, and then again, don't forget to vote for our next book uh, for the Mythgard Academy, and I will announce that next week. So thanks everybody. Good night now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.